Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. On behalf of MarketWare, Barla McCarthy and the Association for Advancing Physician Provider Recruitment, welcome to a session on preparing your candidates for virtual interviews. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Carrie Bennett. Before joining MarketWare, I spent 17 years in a variety of physician development roles, including recruitment, onboarding, and outreach. I am joined today by Mitzi Kent with Barlow McCarthy, as well as Liz Mahan from AAPPR. Mitzi and Liz, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Mitzi, will you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so I am a partner with Barlow and McCarthy. Uh, we do a lot with, um, we are a healthcare consulting company and do everything that um, talks about around physicians. Um, mainly I am on the recruitment space, doing a lot with uh, in-house physician recruiters, helping them support their teams um, and showing them um, ways to improve their recruitment efforts, as well as focusing on their onboarding efforts. Fantastic. And then Liz, I know that you also recently joined the team at AAPPR and before that also served in a physician recruitment role. Can you talk a little bit about yourself and your new role? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so prior to joining AAPPR, I was a physician recruiter in-house for a health system in Western Massachusetts for five years. Uh, I recently joined the team at the Association for Advancing Physician and Provider Recruitment as a physician recruitment advisor. And that's really bringing the, the role and voice of a physician recruitment uh, professional in-house to AAPPR to help them develop content and to work with our members to ensure that we have the best tools, resources, uh, and enrichment materials available in the market. Fantastic. And I know one of those tools that you've been working on, Liz, has been a guide to virtual um, interviews. And that's something that you guys are in the process of posting later today. And so a lot of the people who are on today's call uh, will be able to have access to some of that great content um, as soon as you guys make it available. So I know people yes. are probably very excited about that. We've had a lot of questions so, about that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, and that, that's, that's pretty evident with the number of uh, registrants that we had for today's topic, and so if you're new to MarketWare, we are a web-based um, platform that supports the use of both data and business development strategies to advance physician relationships across the continuum, starting with recruitment to onboarding, network development, and retention, and, um, and so we, you know, if you're not familiar with us, we certainly um, appreciate the opportunity to get to know you better now. Uh, Missy, will you tell us a little bit more? I know you mentioned a little bit about what Barlow McCarthy does, but obviously you guys um, have also been around for some time helping a variety of, of organizations, 400 plus, I think is where I saw on your website last. And so tell us a little bit more about what you guys do. Sure. Um, so a, a lot of our time has been spent into two big areas, one on the physician relations side where um, Chris Barlow and Susan Bartell, um, um, I mean, Susan um, Boydell spend the majority of their time. And then um, for uh, my time, it's spent a lot on the physician recruitment, uh, medical staff development, planning, and physician onboarding, where we help organizations um, look at best practices and way to streamline process processes and be able to um, help um, executive leadership look at ways to utilize in-house uh, recruitment teams. Um, big proponents for in-house recruitment teams and so we always are working with executive teams about how they can enhance um, those teams. And so Liz, um, I know that you talked um, a little bit about yourself, but can you talk to us a little bit about AAPPR? Absolutely. So AAPPR, or the Association for Advancing Physician and Provider Recruitment, uh, is a professional organization not only for physician and provider recruiters, but also leaders and others who are influential in the process of recruitment, onboarding, and retention for their organizations. We offer our members uh, the ability to connect and learn, and most importantly, to advance their careers through our education platforms, research, and member engagement. Uh, the goal of APPR is to redefine recruitment to retention by empowering industry experts uh, with the tools and resources to really be at the top of their profession. Thank you so much. 
So before we dive in, we did want to ask just kind of where people are. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, participation on today's call. And so we wanted to launch a poll um, just to get an idea of where people are in the process of going virtual. And, and some of it um, may be virtual interviews. And there are also some of you who are going through and, and creating virtual on-site visits. And so definitely curious about where today's group stands. And so um, I know that it's been kind of a mixed bag depending on the clients and the friends and colleagues that we've talked to uh, just based on preparing for, for the webinar series that, that we're putting together. But for us, you know, I feel like that there are some people who are placing things on hold because they're trying to figure out how do I showcase all the great things that about my organization, my community, when I can't have people come on site live. Um, but Missy, we found that there are quite a few people who are getting out there and, and, and finding different ways to bring people on board. Can you tell us some, some examples of what your clients are seeing? Yeah, um, Carrie, we, I have a, a couple of clients right now that have reached out to me to say, hey, can you help me set up this uh, virtual um, on sites and, and um, all the way to, to virtual onboarding, which I know we're going to be talking about um, next, uh, next week, but um, they, they don't have the opportunity to, to place this on hold. They have some physician practices, mainly primary care, that are in trouble, and they know that when this crisis ends, if they don't have the primary care to um, to be able to support that practices, those practices will have to close. So they've actually looked at their whole, um, and we're doing a lot of sourcing for them, their whole um, um, catalog and menu of physicians that they need and prioritized. And those that were critical are the ones that are going through the virtuals and the ones that we they think they can hold, um, they're gonna hold on those. So they have two surgeons that they are gonna do all virtually and um, th about three or four primary care. Interesting. And so based on the group that we have in our audience today, it looks like about two thirds of the audience are already kind of migrating towards those virtual visits. They're probably in a very similar scenario um, as, as, your, as your clients are, um, where they really can't afford to hold necessarily. So they're really trying to figure out how to, how to bridge that gap. I'd like to ask from a, from a poll perspective also, um, how many of you that are, that are making that jump to virtual who are either on your way there or already there? Tell us a little bit more. How many visits have you had so far? Um, has it been a handful and so you're still in the learning process of it or are you, you know, are you kind of mastering it? Now you're on a roll and you're kind of, you're making it happen if you will. So I'm curious as to how many you've had so far. I would say the biggest shift from, from the clients that I've talked to, it's been you know, right in March, right, right around mid-March, they were still on the cusp of when the travel restrictions were going to be in place. And so we saw a lot of people, you know, kind of digging in to get whatever visits they could get done before, you know, at, you know, still done in-house, done around that. And so most of the on-site, virtual on-sites have been more towards April and the start of April. So I'm curious what, um, and so it looks like as we if I share the results, it looks like most of you have done a handful at this point. So it's still sort of a learning process for everybody and trying to kind of figure out how to how to get, you know, how to tweak it, if you will, and make the process um, right. I'm curious for those of you who, who've done that, then how many of you actually signed? And so, it, you know, it, has it been just site visits or are you actually able to connect the dots and are you feeling like you're actually getting some traction on those visits? And so if you wouldn't mind, letting us know, you know, are you, are you getting signatures at the end of those? Mickey, I know that we've actually had some people who've done, you know, eight to 10 site visits that we know that have actually signed two or three candidates, which aren't bad odds within that percentage. Yeah, yeah, we have um, a couple of my clients um, in the Northeast area have, uh, had the ability to um, actually go through that whole process virtually um, and probably have had more um, communication with each other than they would have if they've gone through the normal process with them, um, <laughs> but have signed sight unseen. And so um, they're um, certainly um, a needed therapy, a needed service service line. And in order to keep that continuing, they felt the need to go ahead and, and, and have that physician sign. So um, 
but uh, they are, they're excited. They're excited to um, get started. Um, this was uh, a need that this uh, physician had to do in a time frame to get closer to family. So there were specific needs. The hospital had a specific need and this candidate had a specific need to get to a location during a certain time. And the COVID-19 crisis was um, something that, that, that was not really going to interfere in that timing side. So I think that there are some specific um, things that are causing some of these unsight um, signings happening. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you what's interesting is it seems like uh, many of you um, there that are responding um, today of, of those people that are responding, we are seeing that there are, you know, almost 80 of the organizations represented by today's participants are seeing some signatures, you know, with with a virtual on-site. So those are some pretty strong results and, and shows that there are those needs and, and there are those ways that you can make those connections and, and help people feel comfortable and confident in making a good decision on both sides of the, of the table for, for a good fit. So let's talk a little bit, you know, we're, we're talking about on-site visits and going virtual. And certainly that is, you know, an important part of the recruitment process when it comes to looking at long-term fit and, and assessing that, that fit on both sides. Um, Mitzi, you and I hosted a webinar last week where we talked about going virtual and what do you need to do when it comes to an on-site visit as far as helping to connect the dots on some of those things that are not as easy to convey virtually, like your culture, like the community at large. And so we did have a lot of great best practices and tips for making that transition. And one of the tips that we've talked about specifically is setting the right expectations with your candidate and then setting the right expectations with your team. And we got a lot of great questions and feedback from that session um, that really talk to, you know, what are some specific things that I need to do to prep both sides and what are some other, other additional examples, which was sort of the impetus for today's conversation is really kind of what are some of those things that um, I need to share in advance and how can I share it in a way that is going to be helpful to my candidate or helpful to my team. And so just to revisit that content for those who you know, weren't with us last week and haven't had a chance to maybe check out the recording of that call, we've, you know, we've talked a little bit about you know, making sure you give a good summary of the, of the virtual interview or the virtual on-site process that you talk about, you know, you provide the right agenda that has all the different embedded links to the meeting room so it's easy for them to get to and, and kind of simple that you um, are incorporating some, some links to LinkedIn profiles or Doximity profiles or fun facts about the, the, the people on both sides of the interview in advance just to kind of help break the ice, if you will that you offer some sample questions, that you make sure there's a backup phone number to reach you in case of technical difficulties. And that also there's like a cheat sheet of other helpful tips that you can give that provider in advance. And so would you mind just for those who weren't able to join us last week, would you mind helping us kind of so, you know, sort through some of the things that we've already shared that I think were really geared around the on-site visit but certainly I think could even be used or repurposed to support the virtual interview that would occur both during the on-site visit, but even one step ahead of that. Sure, absolutely. So um, some of the things that I shared last week, and again, um, if you did um, join and receive um, the uh, email with the slides, you also received a link. Um, that was for you to um, get this sample uh, virtual site itinerary that you can make your own, um, which really just talks a little bit about um, just how you set that up with the links embedded in there. Um, but key things to look at when you talk about a virtual visit itinerary was what the discussion was going to include and four or five bullet points. That helps keep the topic um, concise. And when you are doing a virtual, it's very important about keeping that message concise. And so that helps the candidate as well as your internal team know these are the four main bullets or three main bullets I need to cover during my section of this interview. 
Um, the sample checklist, which was another thing that we touched on um, last week, and if any of you all um, saw my video blog on LinkedIn or um, also last week on the webinar, um, this also was provided to you and there will be um, a link that comes out with the slides from this. Um, is This was a quick checklist that you can, again, brand as your own and um, has just a few tips to give to the candidate. Um, it's nice for that candidate to have something ahead of time just to review for them to just make sure that they are, are ready for the interview. They're nervous um, a lot of times for an interview, but this just helps um, put at ease as they're going through that virtual interviewing um, piece of that as well too. And I noticed that we had a question in the box about um, some of those that were getting offers um, had they visited the facility before the COVID 19 crisis. Um, in my case of my two clients that have made the offers, one um, from a surgical perspective had visited the um, hospital before and so they were not unfamiliar with this candidate. Um, so this was kind of like a second visit, but the primary candidate had not. Um, so um, I think it does depend on that specialty. So just to answer that question. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, I've had I've had something similar where, you know, some people have either it was a second visit, if you will, because they were still kind of evaluating opportunities and narrowing down the options, but I, I and, or had been a previous resident maybe and had trained there, so had some familiarity with, with the opportunity um, before, but there are quite a few examples. I can think of a couple handfuls, in fact, of, of examples of clients who said that they were able to bring someone sight unseen because of the partnership with their community leadership and with the realtors to, to really help make sure that they filled in the gaps on what the experience was like moving there. And um, so I am definitely seeing some that are not going to be, um, you know, there aren't, there are first on sites, if you will, who don't have familiarity with the area. Liz, I'm assuming you're seeing a little bit of the same. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been a little bit of a mixed bag, but as the situation continues to evolve and certainly the longer that we're in it, um, I think our members and recruitment professionals everywhere are becoming more creative with how they handle things and how they're able to get candidates through the process in a very unconventional time. Absolutely. And just before we move on to kind of really talking more about just the interview prep, I know one of the things that Mitzi, you had suggested for the virtual interview was talking through, you know, what sample questions you might, you know, share with the physician in advance, just again, because of that whole being more clear and concise, and also maybe even sharing with your team to know how the physician might be preparing. And so these are, as a reminder, these are some of the examples that you shared. Are there other things that we should be considering as far as, as questions for, for one setting versus the other? Um, yeah, so I think, again, everybody has their toolbox. Um, many of you all as recruiters have your favorite questions and ones that, that are important for you to draw out the culture of your organization or the key uh, questions to find if they're going to be a right fit. Um, so, but these are some that um, we've collected over the ways that that we feel um, are ones for the candidates to kind of think a little bit about how they would answer those. Um, you'll see later in the presentation as we try to think about ways to prep the candidates so that they can kind of tell their story in a clear and concise manner. Um, and some of these get them to think about those stories. So this is just one of those samples. Awesome. So really, when we think about prepping the candidate and we kind of really dig into what that looks like, um, you know, we focused again, not just on the on-site visit, but the fact that you have the opportunity really to look at virtual interviews from a different perspective, even before an on-site is, is considered. And how, how do you really um, prepare the candidate and some of the things that we have found has worked really well for our clients and our colleagues has been really to, to give some guidance to the provider on how they can best set the stage so that they have an area that, you know, that really works for them for these types of, of interviews and that they kind of understand some things to consider um, with the technology and how to best, you know, put their best foot forward um, virtually. 
And that includes kind of letting them know what best practices you've been able to uncover by doing this type of process with others, or maybe it's just by nature of you working from home now and doing a lot of your own, you know, Microsoft team or zoom meetings and being able to kind of know what works well in a virtual environment. Um, encouraging them to test and practice in advance, and then also being maybe helpful with sharing some more natural opportunities for follow through that um, maybe may look or feel a little bit differently, knowing that a lot of people are working from home. Um, and there's just different things that that different expectations that may need to be set on both sides of the table. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, it, you know, offering tips obviously that are obvious, maybe like choosing a clean, quiet, well-lit space for the interview and testing this space in advance to ensure that there aren't any distractions or issues. Um, you know, this sometimes can go without saying, but it's helpful, I think, in, in an area where we have, you know, a lot of people maybe working from home and doing a lot of stuff together. Uh, it can be helpful maybe to kind of set a zone in advance and test that zone to make sure that it, it's presenting uh, the way you would expect it to and being able to kind of do that in advance. I think it's also helpful because you have so many people who might be working from home or they're taking time out from, you know, the COVID-19 response to, to conduct the interview. Um, being able to kind of set the stage and say, you know, what is the dress code for this as compared to a normal on-site interview? And, and, you know, what we want people to be comfortable, maybe not too comfortable. So what is that, what does that uh, dress code look like on both sides of, of the interview process so everyone feels like they're, you know, they're coming to the table the same way. And then what are some things that you can suggest to make sure they understand that the video will be used um, to be able to kind of help facilitate that relationship building? And if so, what are some things that will help make it less distracting for them or give them a chance to, um, you know, be able to practice making eye contact because that's sometimes not very natural um, when you're talking to a screen or when you have multiple people on the screen at once and, and being able to kind of help strike that, that personal professional balance by um, considering what other things they might be able to do in advance to to help um, support that. I know Mitzi that you have some other things that you've been sharing with candidates in advance to kind of help them prepare for the interview process, including kind of what to have and things to consider with communication. Would you mind sharing some of that with our, our yeah. participants today? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, a lot of this trial and error and, and again, some of the stuff that uh, you already know, um, but just good reminders for our candidates and, and what we can do um, to help them out. So a copy of the itinerary, we're always telling the candidates to have that. Uh, print it out, um, but also electronically so that they can click on those links um, and that helps them not have to type that in um, their CV, their job descriptions, any other documents or anything else that they submit it um, to be able to um, be able to respond to the job description, um, be able to reply back to what they're being asked for. And another trick that was um, something we actually learned, um, one of my clients and I, with a candidate that was just, I mean, you could tell the candidate was really nervous and there were some really key points that they wanted to make. Um, they actually put some of the key things about their training and their experience that they felt mel uh, really met what this um, organization was looking for and they just wanted to make sure they remembered them so they put them on a, some sticky notes and they um, stuck them to the perimeter of the screen of the computer so they were kind of clues to them right because we should be looking at the camera and the camera on the computer screen and so they were constantly looking at them and it just really kind of put their mind at ease so I thought that was a really great tip and, and have been sharing that with uh, other clients um, moving forward so again just um, some great tips just to give those candidates as well as um, your internal team couple of other things that we talk about um, when it comes to the communication is really kind of that verbal and nonverbal. And, and we talked a lot about that ability to be flexible. And um, during this COVID-19 time, um, I think a lot of organizations are trying to see if candidates are flexible and adaptable during these challenging times. That'll show, you know, is this going to be somebody I'm going to be able to manage? Um, is this somebody that's going to be able to work well with in this practice. And so um, one that does not get really frustrated or flustered with some of the technology challenges is, is um, so reminding the candidate of that, that, um, you know, hey, things happen. Um, and then also just making sure that candidate is just really focused on what they're saying and being very clear and, and articulating their message. 
um, and making sure that they do understand whether they need to um, repeat that question if they weren't sure what they heard, just to make sure that they're answering that um, the way that the interviewer is asking that of them. We know that there's a delay in some of that uh, communication. So we wanna make sure that our verbal and our nonverbal um, is is on point and we want to just promote tools that that help them do that so i always tell them you know it's hard to remember to look at that camera so maybe you put a little you know sticky or a sticker right there so that just it focuses um, your attention at that camera and um, really just talk about and and focus on why you feel you're the best uh, candidate for that role one of the things that um, we got feedback from many of the candidates that we were sourcing um, for one of the roles was that they felt that because of their limited time on a virtual and especially because of the feedback and you don't know when you can interject where in person you kind of get that feel and and can pick up on some of those nonverbals um, was the length of some of the candidates responses um, so when we got some feedback of that, we decided to do um, a, a little mini training with some of our candidates before we, we put them in front of the internal teams. Um, and so we uh, worked on star interviewing, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, situation, task, action, result. And um, we really focused here about just making sure that the physician um, really stayed on track with answering that question in a very clear and concise manner. Um, talking about, yes, I had a situation and this was what happened. Um, and here's what I personally did and here's how I worked with the team to accomplish this. And here was the result. Um, and then asking if they needed um, to elaborate even more, was there something more to say um, or something more that they wanted them to elaborate on. And when we started to coach our, our candidates that way, um, we got a lot of positive responses from our organization saying, oh, the interview went um, much better. We didn't feel like they rambled too much. I think I got a really good understanding about how they would be a fit. Um, and so it was just one little tip, a, a nugget as a recruiter, um, a how to kind of support the candidates for some of these virtual um, and then again, panel interviews that you're doing virtually. So either from an onsite or, or a prior to an onsite. Absolutely. I think that's such a, that's a, I think that those of us who are in recruitment kind of see some of those interview tips and best practices that sometimes candidates don't necessarily have access to or, and, and don't maybe have practice with. So I definitely think that's a really great uh, tip to share. And I think that kind of leads right into our next point, which is practice makes perfect. Um, there, it's, it can be really important, you know, before today's webinar, for example, we got on 30 minutes early to make sure that we didn't have any audio issues, that everyone could hear us, that the screens would pull up and advance the way we expected them to. And so similarly, you'd want to have a little bit of practice in advance to make sure that they're, you know, whatever technology that you're using, that it, it can be downloaded and used by the candidate without a lot of um, fanfare or issues on the day of and even potentially do some type of test run where I think you know could be a great point to do some of that um, star practice as well as, as kind of looking at some of the other things that um, you're suggesting Mitzi and I think it's great to then also make sure that there aren't any you know camera or microphone issues that you know with the device that they may be using and that if you have to share stuff together as well that everybody feels really comfortable with you know how to how to pull that up and uh, and share without taking a lot of time away from the interview itself. Liz, I know that you know you guys have also talked to a lot of your membership and have really heard a lot of feedback from them about the interview process and what candidates are experiencing. And so, would you mind sharing some you know additional best practices that you feel like will will fall in line with what we're discussing here? Absolutely. So you know it's important to remember that. Not everybody is tech savvy, and that's on both sides, those interviewing as well as the candidates who are being interviewed. So as recruitment professionals, we really need to be sure that we're supporting both parties and providing a judgment-free zone to make sure that the technology is working right and everybody is comfortable working on a virtual platform. So some things that our members have done is practice with the candidates. Um, in addition to that initial screening phase, um, having, you know, just a few minutes to run through, as Mitzi said, 
um, you know, the star model and ensuring that the candidate is really comfortable um, working on a virtual platform. You want the focus of the interview to stay on the candidate and on the interviewer, not on the technology. Um, people are nervous enough in an interview, you don't need to add the stress, you know, is my signal going to be consistent? Um, you know, is my camera going to fall off the screen during the interview? Um, things of that nature. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I do think you're right. I mean, the interview process in general, especially when you're really interested in the candidate or the candidate's really interested in your, your opportunity or location, um, there's already a certain set of nerves there. So, you know, whatever you can do to help, you know, calm those a little bit with, with practice or with, with connectivity and communication, I think are key. Um, of course, connectivity and communication don't just matter during the interview itself. You know, Mitzi, I think we've talked before about how many deals are won as far as, you know, being able to sign a candidate on the line based on follow up and follow through, you know, showing the interest and doing the work that it takes on both sides. Um, and that's, you know, that's often we talk about it from our perspective when it comes to signing the candidate and then organizing their onboarding and kind of showing really great continuity and, and touch points there. But there's also some work on the physician side that can be done after the interview to really help put their best foot forward. I know that you um, often coach candidates on that as well. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about what you uh, share with them? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, a couple of, of lesson learns that we saw is, is certainly, um, we've all said that it really comes down to the, the follow up and follow through, like you said, Carrie, um, where we've, you know, many candidates will come back to us and say, well, it was a great on site interview and then I heard nothing. Um, but in this time um, with, with the COVID crisis and everything that um, leadership is having to go through, it's not been, um, it, it's been hard to get back to some of these candidates and getting the feedback from the internal team. Um, and so um, as recruiters and as those supporting the candidates, um, we are reminding the um, candidates that for them to be patient and that due to the circumstances, follow up is probably going to take a little bit longer um, than usual to get back. And so as we remind our candidates to write those thank you notes, um, whether it is an email or however they're going to correspond, um, for them to be thinking about that, to um, remember that um, they should be staying informed um, about that facility that they are interviewing with, um, the changing, rapidly evolving situation and um, with that organization and to thank that um, interviewer for their frontline service and to say, you know, I'd love to be part of that team and, and, um, and, and let them know that, that they are thinking of them through this and realize that um, that is their first and priority right now is taking care of those patients. So um, well, that's just a tip that we continue to, to help our candidates and, and the organizations have, have really liked the fact that, that um, they feel the candidates have been very considerate through um, everything that they've been going through as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of super old school with thank you notes, so I tend to like to write the handwritten thank you notes and put them right through the snail mail to their, you know, their work address, which of course, you know, would be pretty much not, not received at this point since many people are working from home, depending on their role within the organization and, mm -hmm. and kind of where they're spending their time. But um, I do feel like I, I've had some people say that they're, they're actively sharing a list of, um, of who's participating in the interview process and some type of like email or contact point that that the that they can the candidate can use then to do some of that follow up and do some of those thank yous and and feel like they can connect the dots on the on the back end of that. Um, but again, I really loved your idea last week um, of even a step before that because you don't have the normal time you'd have for shaking hands and chit chatting before you kind of get down to the business of the interview itself. I loved your idea of also providing within that same type of sheet a couple of fun facts or something of interest that might help prep both sides for what those people are about, both not just in, in their professional role, but from a personal standpoint to help kind of break the ice and give, and give something there that we kind of start, you know, just kind of, you know, get things started. So I think there's definitely ways you could do that both before, but also that help support this follow up. Right, right. And, and, um, you know, you can do that a lot with, um, 
as you're, um, you know, setting up where, where you're going to be doing that interview. Um, many folks, we've, we've told the candidates, you know, you're not able to talk about maybe your family or, or your hobbies like you do when you sit down and that's how you break the ice. But if, if you decide right. to do the virtual interview from your office, maybe you have pictures of, of, you know, your favorite, you know, golfer behind you or some things like that, that could help break the ice so that the conversation starts oh, yeah. up a lot of conversational. Yeah, that's a fantastic tip as well. So we've talked a lot about prepping the candidate, but there's also, you know, I think I think Liz mentioned it at the beginning of the call that, you know, it, this is not necessarily a, a very natural way of interviewing candidates from the team perspective either. So there, you know, while we've been focused on that, I do think being able to prep your team can be helpful. And so some of the things that we've talked about um, on the candidate side, I think you can also put in place on the team side. But specifically, we've talked about um, in preparing for today, really how important it is to share pertinent details in advance and to put in some prep time to understand a little bit about the roles and responsibilities of the different members you're including on the hiring team, um, how the recruitment manager can really serve um, in a kind of a facilitator role, if you will, and then opportunities for follow up and follow through on our side. So Mitzi, why don't you talk through a little bit of what you're seeing out there as far as the best practices when it comes to preparing teams for that virtual interview or the virtual on-site portions that are, that are interview-like. Okay. Great, yeah. So I, I think it's a lot the same as, as if you were doing an on-site, a regular on-site. Everybody's getting copies of the CVs and, and, and keynotes from, from the interviews um, being done. But again, that, that virtual setup, because some of them are, will be doing it from home, what that agenda looks like. But if it's going to be some sort of a panel or a group interview, what is everybody's role and who is going to be identified as the lead in each session, I think is important so that there is not this um, everybody's kind of talking at the same time um, that helps for a very smooth technical conversation um, and um, then just kind of talking through hey you know I'll let you in, ask some questions and I'll, I'll pitch it over back to you again because you don't have that ability of the nonverbals to say you know dr. Smith would you like to ask a few questions um, and then again I, just identifying who who's going to cover what questions and what roles, but also everybody should know who's going to answer what questions for the candidates too. Um, there might be multiple people that think that they should answer questions in regards to the culture of the practice. Um, and so maybe some of those questions that were shared ahead of time um, where nonverbals are easily read when you're in a group meeting to say, you know, I'll take that one, or, you know, you can hear, see somebody leaning in. You don't see that in a virtual interview. And so, so um, there might be some key questions that you know that the candidate would ask and so that you look very organized. Um, it's a great one to say, hey, if they ask about this, I'll take the lead on that question. If they ask about, um, you know, salary or CMEs, I'll take that question. Um, and so that everybody kind of knows what their role is in that piece. It's a great way to prep your teams. And that kind of goes along with some other tips that you had as far as putting in some additional prep time and, and coaching. And so talk a little bit about maybe some, I think these are actually great tips to have for normal interview processes, but certainly, again, because of the dynamics of an interview, pro, of a virtual interview, tell us a little bit more about how you're coaching leaders and other members of the hiring team. Yeah, th this one, this this happened, um, this actually came out of um, with a CEO that we were working with um, that actually just kind of, again, very busy, but just really went into that the interview mode and, and said, you know, I just went really into interview mode and I really didn't get to know the candidate the way I'd like to get them to know them. And usually when they're in my office, we'll talk about this. And so we really just talked about what are some ways to really start a, um, an interview that you do in the office. It'd be the same way as you would do some of those questions. And we talked a little bit about that comfort level they had and, and how, how they could personalize that, talking a little bit about themselves first and their background and why they work with the company first, um, where sometimes it, the CEO tended to just start with the candidate first, tell me a little bit about you, 
and and can see that it was a little bit more um, uncomfortable. So um, she decided to start with her in the interviews and that seemed to kind of put the candidates more at ease. Um, And then again, um, one of the things to show the candidate um, that you are very interested in them is there might be something about that you see as a recruiter in the their CV that might be very interesting and you know it's interesting to the um, CEO or to that executive leadership. Um, we will uh, sometimes highlight that for the CEO and just say, hey, I'd like to point this out. I thought this was really interesting and you might want to explore this further. And that just shows the candidate about how um, interested you are in them. And it just says, hey, I caught this, you know, this caught my eye when I was looking at doing some research reviewing your CV and that also puts the candidate at, at ease as well that that you're interested in in this candidate absolutely and I, and I love doing that also you know even if it's not the CV just from screening notes if there's some interesting things that came out of the screening notes that we had mm-hmm. that we're kind of able to pass along in advance and highlight those yeah. then I think that that you know that can really help kind of set the stage yeah, I was going to say, it's amazing the, the, what leadership says about those screening notes. They really d- they rely on those recruiters for those screening notes. Right. Um, one of the things I think that recruitment managers are finding, at least those I'm talking to, is really having to play hostess, if you will, or, or, or more of a facilitator role in, you know, making sure more, a little bit more hands-on than they would normally be for for a lot of the the interviews that they would conduct either on site or before that and so what we're finding is you know you're you're having to kind of join in and at the beginning to be almost like the the facilitator hostess of a call and and kind of troubleshoot if there's any issues or if people are running behind or late and um, and being able to kind of um, you know give some kind of housekeeping tips if you will on both sides Um, the other thing that I'm finding is that you know it's really helpful to um, you know, be a part of those calls sometimes. Also, just to you know, keep track of some key observations as you're kind of watching the room, if you will. Um, but also, not just from the perspective of a of, of potential fit on both sides, but also if the, if you are one of the you know the groups that are doing this and they're a little bit newer at it, then it gives you a chance to see what's working or what's not working so that you can help improve the process. And, um, and I think you can also kind of cut some of the tension, if you will, if people are getting a little bit anxious about some of the distractions that might be around us just by nature of, of working maybe or doing things in a different environment than we would normally be interviewing in um, at this point in time. And so that's, that's another kind of area. Liz, I know that you have also been kind of monitoring the situation, talking with a lot of your members who are um, you know, in this role of, of hostess, if you will, and trying to, um, you know, coordinate and, and help their teams. What are some other suggestions that you're seeing out there that, you know, just based on the members you're talking to? So one thing that we've, that we've seen um, is the suggestion that people take notes by hand. Uh, you know, it can be hard and very tempting when you're doing a virtual interview to do everything on the computer. But it's important to remember that that takes your attention away from the camera and from the people that you're interviewing with or the people that you're interviewing. Um, So going a little bit old school and taking notes by hand really minimizes the clicking through windows and, you know, the potential to accidentally click something that's going to create some tech havoc. Um, We've also heard and and been doing a little bit of research on this new phenomenon that's called zoom burnout um so so what some experts are finding is that it can be a little bit overwhelming uh with virtual everything at the moment so virtual meetings webinars interviews everything's moved online And as human beings who are social by nature and we pick up verbal and nonverbal cues, it can be hard for everybody on a virtual meeting to be looking at multiple people. So, you know, panelists, three, four, five people um, and trying to read everybody's nonverbal cues and body language. So, you know, some of our members have looked at scaling back and stepping away from that temptation to have a Zoom meeting or a Zoom interview or a Skype interview with multiple people and really limiting that to maybe having three people on the call. Um, The other thing that's important to remember, uh, when you have a candidate in person, 
you know, I think throughout the day they're being plied with beverages. Um, you know, we're always asking, can, <laughs> True. can you coffee? Can we get you water? Um, it's okay to stay hydrated during a virtual meeting or a virtual interview. So I encourage people to have water on hand and to use it as needed. <laughs> but that is easy to sometimes overlook if you're uh, in the moment. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Some other things, you know, obviously, you know, as a facilitator, that recruitment manager can certainly look and, and make observations. Mitzi, are there other things that teams should be doing a little bit differently when it comes to follow up on a virtual interview? Um, the only thing I want to point out here, um, uh, Carrie, is I have had some organizations tell me that they have changed their interview form to be um, a little bit shorter and to be okay. online, more of like a survey monkey, um, to be able to get feedback faster um, versus something that was a little bit more lengthy. Okay. And is there any change? And that's, I'm assuming that's to get feedback from the team at Self about the candidate. Um, is there anything that you feel like is, is being done differently um, from the recruitment's perspective, recruiter's perspective, as far as reaching out to candidates and, and, and giving that follow up or the next steps in the process from your perspective? Um, no, I do feel like that they're just staying close in contact with them, um, which I think they've always done. And then again, just explaining that the process would probably be a little bit longer due to, um, you know, the priorities at hand of, of taking care of the patients um, and those in the front line. Fantastic. Well, I'll say this, um, you know, while the focus for today was really on what we would do to prep the candidate and prep the team for the, the interview piece, um, we did have a lot of feedback and questions last week about the on-site visit and, again, that community and, and that culture sense and how do we, how we connect the dots on those when, when the candidate can't come to town. And so based on those of you who've been responding behind the scenes and the questions about, you know, who you have signed and, and kind of what, what visits you're doing, um, I'd, we'd love to be, share some different examples. We've reached out to friends, we've reached out to clients and colleagues to say, you know, what are some of the ways you're doing that? And so when we talk about overcoming drawbacks, we just want to kind of give you a, um, a glimpse at some of the things that we're seeing out there that may be interesting for you to check out as well. If you don't already have this in place today, it may be worth pursuing, but I'll say that when it comes to um, the field, what we're finding is that many of you are finding, you know, really nice ways to proactively reach out and share the changes in your on-site and in your interview process and how you're making virtual, you know, how you're making that virtual and that you're still hiring and you're still moving forward with the process that you aren't on hold or pause um, just because of the travel restrictions. And so I think that that really helps convey your commitment um, to the recruitment process and your commitment to the health of your team and the health of your community and the candidates. Um, and so that's something that is really, um, you know, something that we're seeing a lot of. We see a lot of people maximizing their existing website and leveraging maybe videos or tours that are for other parts of the, you know, that aren't normally on their recruitment page, but have been built for other parts of their organization or for their community, like the economic development. Um, side of your chamber that are using that to really help boost maybe the experience, if you will, that they would have if they came on site. And then also really leveraging video testimonials, not just again, the testimonials you already have maybe access to from patients or employees or from physicians, um, depending on how your marketing messages, you know, and, and your brand, but also finding people who have been through your process before the travel restrictions and can speak to the how well organized you all are when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to onboarding and practice ramp up and why they should choose you because from their perspective as a physician who's been through the process. And so just to give you just some really quick examples, um, this one I was able to pull um, from a friend's website where they are, you know, sharing if anybody hits their physician opportunities page, there's a very clear message that says we are still hiring, but this is the direction that we're going in. Um, I've also seen people proactively send out notifications to any of their, their candidates, especially for kind of must fill positions 
that are sending out marketing messages through email to say, you know, we are, this is what we're doing just to make you aware, hoping to draw maybe some interest in from people who have maybe a little bit more time on their hands, depending on their practice situation, um, that give them the opportunity to kind of take advantage of this opportunity and have, you know, additional conversations. We're also seeing people, you know, Mitzi mentioned, talking about your response to COVID can be a fantastic way of showing your commitment to the community and how well organized and, and how thoughtful you are. And so being able to kind of maximize new web pages that are geared towards staffing and physician staffing in particular, or being able to kind of showcase what your response is and how you're reaching out to the community and then reaching in um, among those, you know, individuals who are responding. I think that that's a, you know, there's lots of great examples of that, um, that many of you are incorporating. And if you're not, it may be worth exploring. Um, we've also pulled in some examples you'll see from people who are really, um, you know, trying to find ways of highlighting on, like on the right hand side, what, what living in your community would look like and what are the best things about it from your perspective? What, where can you pull in information again from your chamber or from other entities within your organization to help you highlight that and push that forward so that, again, you can share that with the physician in advance um, or the advanced care practitioner, uh, depending on what you're recruiting for. And then how do you, you know, um, also make it available if they're doing some advanced searching on their own. And there's, there's a couple of different examples of that um, within this that just kind of give you an idea of how do you put your best foot forward and how do you share what you have access to um, that you're able to make, um, make that available and, and kind of put um, an effort to kind of say, this is what, this is what we're all about. And not only just for the physician, but I think also highlighting resources and things for those who, you know, are significant others who may be relocating as well. A lot of times we put a lot of stuff on our um, physician opportunity sites that are really appealing to the person who's looking for the practice opportunity, but knowing how key um, the connectivity of the other members of the family could be, it, it can be equally as important, I think, to consider some of those areas and create some, some connectivity uh, for that group as well. And now, kind of, before we uh, kind of wrap up, I will say that there's lots of, again, virtual tours or physician recruitment videos that people, you know, who created those in advance or been able to create those quickly, um, they've really been able to use that to highlight and promote from the physician's perspective exactly what makes the recruitment team and the onboarding process at your organization so fantastic and why they would recommend other people um, are, you know, is, you know, take a chance and, and, and partner with the team as well, even if, uh, even in this virtual environment, if you will. I would love just to uh, touch base with our audience today to ask a couple of additional questions, including um, where are you in the process? Many of you, while we have a, a nice influx of physicians, if you will, in the third quarter, you know, when schools are out, for example, um, and when training programs are concluded, um, you know, that's when most of the, of the onboarding process, you know, is, is sometimes in full swing. But we have a lot of people who say they have providers joining right now. And so I'm curious, based on today's attendees, how many of you, um, you know, are in process or already, you know, have mastered, if you will, going virtual with your new provider onboarding? And so it looks like, um, based on what we're seeing here today, it's about 40% about of you are, are getting there, and a lot of you are still kind of getting ready, if you will, which, which matches, I think, Mitzi, a lot of what I'm seeing. Um, yeah. Would you say the same? Yeah, I think that's what we're seeing now. That's many of my clients are like, okay, we've done some hiring now. Um, you know, help me figure out how do we do some of this cultural training, some of this other type of um, training. Uh, how can we do certain parts and pieces virtually? Um, which I think is one of your next polls about what what's the pain point of of onboarding. Absolutely. And that's really what we're interested in. Since we're going to be focusing on this, there are, again, some natural parts like credentialing and um, some other areas that, you, you know, happen almost virtually now anyway. But what, what are some of those areas that are going to be maybe the more, the, for those of you who are, whether you're already there getting ready or not ready, what are some of those things that you feel like are going to be barriers that your team is still trying to overcome that we can make sure that as um, we plan ahead for next week that we're hitting on those areas that are the most important for you. And so certainly interested in seeing a little of that. Um, 
and it may and it may be that it's a mix of these. I think that the poll only gives you one response, but and it certainly could be a mix of of all. But I'm curious to see where we land. So it looks like just the general orientation process um, is kind of one of those areas followed by you know just the relocation process and culture um, uh, piece as well. So certainly certainly some different areas that are. Um, causing people to get creative, but there are definitely, we're seeing some really great workarounds and we're looking forward to sharing those with everyone um, next week. So I'm going to jump back uh, to our final thoughts, uh, Mitzi and Liz, I just, I'll, I'll turn to you first, but uh, Mitzi, tell us a little bit, you know, just as people are making this transition, as they're, as they're getting people prepped, um, what are some final things that you just want to make sure that they keep in mind? I think the final, the, my final thoughts would be just to make sure that you've got the lo open lines of communication that you're asking um, your candidates as well as your internal teams, what are some of the things that will help them um, feel more comfortable through this process? What type of support do they need? Um, and, um, and how can you be a resource to them um, right now through this process? Um, and I think that's probably the best um, advice that I can give, give right now. Absolutely. Liz, how about you? Yeah, I'd echo that. Um, as recruitment professionals, I, you know, I think we're used to being a support and a resource both for candidates and for internal stakeholders. And just keeping those lines of communication open, especially with more people working remotely and not seeing each other face to face. Um, making sure that you're checking in both with candidates and, you know, with your people internally on how they're feeling about the process and reminding them in turn to follow up and check in um, with the candidates. Um, you know, another thing I think it's really important to keep in mind is just patience. Everything is just a little bit different right now, and we're really living and working in an unprecedented time. So everyone is figuring things out on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think making sure that we have patience, um, you know, with each other and, and that we're just encouraging that is really important. Absolutely. Well, we are at the top of the hour, um, but on behalf of MarketWare, on behalf on AAPPR and Barla McCarthy, we certainly appreciate you joining today. Thank you for participating and have a wonderful rest of your day.